Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 11th of our Creator's 10th month as we reckon the calendar according to the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything that's written, which happens to line up with the 23rd of December, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we're going to be covering a post that we've read before on why not to intercalate for a new sister that happens to be looking into the calendar. So just to get into it, We'll read, and then if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. This is pretty self-explanatory. The whole topic is on why we should not add days in between or shift a week or do anything of such nature. With the release of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have, for the first time in well over a thousand years, the means of knowing how to keep track of time based only on what is written. Before getting into the details, let me share a part of the introduction for the calendar information in a new translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls here. Calendars, or writings that presuppose them, comprise a very substantial percentage of the Dead Sea caches. Indeed, as stated in the introduction, adherence to a peculiar calendar is the thread that runs through hundreds or hundred of the Dead Sea Scrolls, should say hundreds. More than any other single element, the calendar binds these works together. It is the calendar that makes the scrolls a collection. The calendar is the intentional element. One thing about the scrolls, and just to point out how prevalent that is, throughout the Psalms that are missing from the Bible, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have allusions to a 364-day year. Dawid's account of his psalms that he wrote, he wrote a song for every day of the year, one for every Sabbath, only 52, or one for every festival, only 30, and that includes only four new month days or remembrance days. So it's very peculiar, and it all ties in with the calendar. That's what the theme is that he's talking about. One thing about the scrolls few seem to keep in mind when determining who wrote them is that internal evidence shows beyond doubt the sons of Zadok, all Kohanim, were the authors and keepers of the scrolls. With that being said, the scrolls which include among them all the common scriptures and apocryphal, apocryphal writings in the original 1611 KJV and the Septuagint, what is called First Enoch, Jubilees, or Yobelim, and more. Simply put, it is the remains of the library of the servants of Yahuwah. That these Kohanim are witnessed about in his word, and that we should take heed of what is in here, can be seen in scripture. Excuse me. <clears throat> it says, Thus said the Adon Yahuwah, no son of a foreigner, uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh, comes into my set-apart place. Even any son of a foreigner who is among the children of Yisrael, and the Luiim who went far from me, when Yisrael went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their inequity. And they were attendants in my set-apart place as gatekeepers of the house and attendants of the house, slaying the ascending offering and the slaughtering for the people and standing before them to attend to them. Because they attended to them before their idols and became a stumbling block of the crookedness of the house of Yisrael, therefore I have lifted my hand in an oath against them declares the Adon Yahuwah, that they shall bear their inequity and not come near me to serve as my Kohen, nor come near any of that which is set apart to me. And you know, he doesn't change. So when you think about this, you can look at the stories from before the Hekel was built, when they first got the inheritance of the land. There was a son of Louis who was with a man that was serving his idols. And when the tribe of Dan came through, first with the scouting mission and then the rest of the people, they acquired him for their own and took the idols with them. So 
there's allusions to that and you also have what happened after they were in the land when Manasseh and others of the the sons of Dawid went apostate and they brought in idolatry and the um the worship of Nimrod and his wife is really what it all comes down to if you ever take the time to really read the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop all of it ties into the first antichrist or the first anti-mashiach what if you will and what he did at the instigation of Satan. But it says, And that they shall bear their inequity and not come near me to serve as my Kohen, nor come near any of that which is set apart to me, nor into the most set apart place. And they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have done. But I shall make them those who guard the duty of the house. They guard the duty of the house, okay? Just like the apostates, they carried the words down even though they didn't keep them. For all its work and for all that has to be done in it. Yet the Kohanim, the Luiim, the sons of Zadok, okay, who guarded the duty of my set-apart place when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall draw near to me to serve me, and shall stand before me to bring to me the fat and the blood, declares the Master Yahuwah. They shall enter my set-apart place, and they shall draw near to my table to serve me, and they shall guard my charge. And then I broke off the text that isn't relevant. It, you can read it if you want to. It's in right in Yehezkiel, but we're trying to keep on point. And this is for the authority of the sons of Zadok as those who guarded his charge that we should heed. And they are to teach my people the difference between the set-apart and the profane and make them know what is unclean and clean. And they shall stand as judges in a dispute and judge it according to my right rulings. And they are to guard my Torot, my, my laws, plural, instructions, and my laws in all my appointed times, and set apart my Sabbaths. That's Yehezkiel or Ezekiel 44, 9 through 16, and 23 and 24. The contribution that you offer up to Yahuwah is 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 in width, and of these is the set apart contribution for the Kohanim. On the north, 25,000 cubits, and on the west, 10,000 in width, and on the east, 10,000 in width, and on the south, 25,000 in length. And the set-apart place of Yahuwah shall be in its midst for the Kohanim of the sons of Zadok, who are Kadosh, or set-apart, who did guard my charge, who did not go astray, when the children of Israel went astray, as the Luiim, or those joined unto me, went astray. Yehezkiel or Ezekiel 48, 8, 9 through 11. In the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves, this is, or this witness is expounded on. And I do believe this is in what is called the exhortation from the Damascus document. It says, through it, the first members of the covenant sinned and were delivered up to the sword because they forsook the covenant of Elohim and chose their own will and walked in the stubbornness of their hearts, each of them doing his own will. Yet with the remnant which held fast to the commandments of Elohim, he made his covenant with Yisrael forever, revealing to them the hidden things in which all Yisrael went, had gone astray. He unfolded before them his Kodesh Sabbaths and his esteemed feasts, the testimonies of his righteousness and the ways of his truth, and the desires of his will which a man must do in order to live. And they dug a well rich in water, and he who despises it shall not live. Yet they wallowed in the sin of man and in the ways of uncleanness, and they said, This is ours. But Elohim in his wonderful mysteries forgave them their sin and pardoned their wickedness, and he built for them a sure house in Yisrael, whose like has never existed 
from former times till now. Those who hold fast to it are destined to live forever, and all the esteem of Adam shall be theirs. As Elohim ordained for them by the hand of the foreteller Yehezkiel, saying the Kohanim, the Luiim, and the sons of Zadok who kept my charge, or who kept the charge of my Hekel, when the children of Israel strayed from me, they shall offer me fat and blood. Yehezkiel, is that... Um, 34.15, sorry. The Kohanim are the converts of Yisrael who departed from the land of Yahuda, and those who joined them. The sons of Zadok are the elect of Yisrael, the men called by name who shall stand at the end of days. Behold the exact list of their names according to their generations, and the time when they lived, and the number of their trials, and the years of their sojourn, and the exact list of their deeds. And then it breaks off, so we're actually missing what it says, and this is added for context. It says, They were the men of Kodeshah. Now, just for reference, this is alluding to men in a later time in a, fore, in a foretold message. This was literally the sons of Zadok that were in the land, who we call the Essenes of, of the Qumran community, if you will, they're the ones that left and went into the wilderness to keep the law according to the dictates of their conscience because it was being perverted in the cities where Babylonian rule was taking precedence. The same kind of phenomenon you see happening today between Rome and every common law country in the world, including America and Britain. <clears throat> it says, They were the men of Kodeshah, set apartness, whom Elohim forgave, and who declared right the righteous and condemned the wicked. And until the age is completed, according to the number of those years, all who enter after them shall do according to the interpretation of the law in which the first were instructed, according to the covenant which Elohim made with the forefathers, forgiving their sins, so shall he forgive their sins also. But when the age is completed, according to the number of those years, there shall be no more joining to the house of Yeh or Yahuda, but each man shall stand on his watchtower. The wall is built, the boundary far removed. Now, after those years, you remember Yahuda was destroyed. 70 AD, the Hekel was destroyed. And then after that time, it was, you know, the good news was spread throughout the world, but it wasn't until Hadrian that it was destroyed completely. And it was turned into Can a... Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. I know you don't see my hand, but I need clarification Certainly. on the statement where it says, each man shall stand on his watchtower. Does that mean that we're all responsible to ourselves instead of our leaders, as far as that's concerned? The wall will be built and the boundary removed. I don't understand that statement. If you could just clarify what you think it is. Yes, ma'am. So I was just trying to go into that. As that stands for us now, when Yahuda was still there and the Hekel was there, all the people three times a year would come to worship before them. It was part of the commands of how to keep his will. After he came, our Mashiach came in the flesh. He instituted the renewed covenant. Um, he gave the constitutions for how to do this after he ascended to his taught ones for the 40 days that he was with them. And this is what is called the apostolic constitutions. Now, if you read the, the Damascus document, and if you read what's called the community rule, and you look at the the assemblies that they built in the wilderness of Yahuda there, and what they were doing, it is almost identical to what the assemblies were doing outside of the land in the apostolic times. The only difference is that the added bonds, the purgations, the required washings, the separations for uncleanness that all required animal sacrifices were all done away. They were, in, they were added after the golden calf to teach righteousness, a spiritual application with a physical thing. So 
the idea of touching a dead body making you unclean and that you had to murder an, or kill an animal to be cleansed and do certain rituals it's no longer required because he is the one and all offering for all so <clears throat> um to b get back on point we had to go well that's to interesting. one more question because yeah. i was thinking of working for tidewell and i thought if i'm dealing with dead bodies all the time I'll never be able to keep the Passover. Exactly. So how do I know which laws are added? Do you have a, a, a document on that you can email me? Yes, there's actually, it goes into detail in the heresy section of the Apostolic Constitution. It talks about all the errant doctrines that were brought in throughout the entirety of the giving of his word. So since the Torah... Is that a book? It's in the Apostolic Constitution's book seven. I'll send you an email because I have, it's a separate one I've also made, but, um, okay. Thank you. And you can reason everything out too. Before the Torah was instituted and before the added bonds were instituted, Yaakov was in the bosom of Abraham when he died. It's in Yobelim. Yahusuf or Joseph touched the dead body of his father and it was never he was never considered unclean. Moshe carried the bones of Yahusuf out and it was attributed as a righteous act. So the his this is what Shaul means by circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but guarding the commands is what matters. Our creator has instituted things by his will, and sometimes he will institute things differently at different times as he sees fit. He's given different instructions for how to keep the feast throughout history. And you can see that in the Bible itself. He's given different ways uh, in the book of Yob Elim, in, you can see that in even more detail. You can see that he's also given different instructions for dietary laws throughout history. So there is nothing inconsistent, but people become dogmatic and believe an opinion instead of proving it with his word, which is what we try and never just take any man's opinion. It has to be proven. So please, anytime you want, ask for those things. And that's what the whole point of sharing is about, right? But to answer this question real quick, when our Mashiach came, the, the Hekel was destroyed 70 AD and the assemblies were built out the boundaries far removed it was now from the rising of the sun to the going of the same his name would be praised among the nations in fulfillment of that foretelling right and that's what this is alluding to there is a point now like we don't even have assemblies very well that we can go to all the time but each man and this is actually also instructed in the apostolic constitutions that if you can assemble, you do so. If you can't do it in a building, you go in a house, but not among unbelievers. And if you have to be by yourself, then you 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 do it by yourself. So <clears throat> there is actually injunction for that very thing. But I do encourage you, if you have the Dead Sea Scrolls, and this is for anyone, read the Damascus document, read the community rule, read the the laws for the communities that they had look at what they were doing and then read the apostolic constitutions the only thing you have to do if you don't have a, a version that's been edited correctly every place you see catholic church you have it say yahad kahal or the united into one assembly and it is almost verbatim except for the pure paganism the corruption that's here and there which you can easily find when you can pair and make multiple witnesses, two or more witnesses establish a matter, right? So, but you read those first and then you read the apostolic constitutions and it was just one's a progression of the other. The only difference is that the added bonds are no longer necessary and that the fullness of our Mashiach, his identity, what he came to do is made known. But even in here, you can see that they knew him. The coming of Melchizedek, who he was, uh, it's amazing stuff that they that the people knew. Um, to get back on track here, this quote you can find in 4Q266 through 4Q268, which is all the fragments or the different scrolls of the Damascus document, okay? 
It says the Dead Sea Scrolls plot using five different cycles. And this is the crux of why you can't add days or add weeks or anything. A 364 yom or days solar cycle based only on the authority of the bridegroom there, right? Psalm 19. A three-year, 354-day lunar cycle. This is not to keep, tra uh, keep track of time in any way, but it's for what Scripture calls the diversity of seasons. And it's this cycle, excuse me, that is conjoined with Gamal and Shechem Yahu, number 22, and number 10 in the order of the, the sons of Zadok that served in the Hekel. Every time they served in the first week of the year was when the full moon was on the first day of the year, which was the sign or the oath that of its renewal. It was a sign of how it was when it was the first day of creation. These things are explained in the text as you go. But that goes through, as we'll continue, it says, there is a six-year cycle for the Kohanim to all serve an equal amount, right? Which leads to the sabbatical year, when the first of that the sixth the first cycle does the seventh cycle, and that is also the shemitah, right? And then there's a forty-nine year yobelim cycle, and then of these, there there's a two hundred and ninety-four year cycle for six jubilee periods. And then they repeat themselves. And that is the complete cycle for the list of the Kohanim, starting from number 22 in the order until it goes through all the way to start with him again. So at the very least, you'd have to go through 294 years before you can add a day. And you can find that when you're reading the scrolls that we're going to cover. But we'll continue. It says, obviously, if this is so... With so many cycles over so many years, it would be impossible to intercalate unless we wait until the last cycle be completely through. When looking for the new year, the key is found in observing the phenomenon he tells us will be in these times, equal parts light and dark, having a full moon every third year as the sign oath or oath the moon makes and seeing the signs that accompany each season as shown in Hanok or 1st Enoch chapter 82, although we only have two of the four seasons expounded on in the book. The calendar, as far as I am aware, was first made known by our late brother Jerry Morris, who started tracking these signs in 2013 and teaching shortly after. I have personally kept this calendar since 2016, which which had a full moon on the first of the month, as it did again in 2019. We are expecting this once again in 2022, which it did happen. I did not personally witness this because of cloud cover, but there was more than one individual in our fellowship, someone in Britain or the U United Kingdom, uh, someone here in Oregon, and they did witness that as well as others. It says, anyone interested can view his teaching on this found here. And this is a YouTube link. He also personally wrote out the 294-year cycle of the Kohen serving in the Hekel, or temple. And they made it into a PDF. I will share it in another email. But all of this proves that the cycle should not be intercalated between years. Some scrolls, like 4Q252 through 4254a, titled Commentaries on Genesis by scholars, show familiar accounts, in this case the flood, with exact dates that line up with the unchanging calendar already shown for the last few weeks. And I was writing this for another group that we were doing stuff with. That's why these are written that way. But in this scroll in particular, it gives you day, day of the week, day of the month explicitly so you know exactly on the calendar where all these points happen. And it lines up explicitly with the Zadok calendar that Jerry Morris made a PDF out of. I'll share that with you guys in a bit. Or the 
the calendar is a picture. The priestly order, he calls it, or the Kohanim order is the PDF. It says, others are specific in content and meant to sync the luminaries, show what Kohen's family would be serving when and when signs or a certain phenomenon would occur, like the full moon on the first of the year. There is a scroll that goes through the full moon, or the, the moon's every lunation, every day of a year for a three-year cycle. It's not complete, and I believe there's one part where the scribe made a mistake and had a redundant section, but you can see it was a very expansive amount of information to try to track the three-year cycle of the moon that you can actually figure out with what we have, which is what our brother uh, Jerry Morris had done. And I do believe our brother that we're uh, Andrew here in the UK has also tracked out the moon, at least the full moons and the, and the dok and the chodesh that we'll get to. So the crescents and the full, right? But it says, which happens every third year and was tracked in such scrolls as 4Q319, calendar of the heavenly lights or signs it's called, the Shamayim signs, right? Before moving into the proofs in the writings that plainly say we do not add more than 364 yamim to a year, not to disturb the years out of their place, we should cover a topic that is a point of contention among the so-called scholars familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls. In writings on the moon, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to anyone who's actually taken the time to honestly learn to share the truth, I say so-called scholars because we have we have documented proof from as far back as 1551 of the Jesuit order, which is the Counter-Reformation created to stop what happened with the Protestant Reformation. And they have been infiltrating everything that is contrary to Catholicism since at least 1551 to pervert them and bring them back under the thumb of Rome. These are demonstrably proven facts. So I say so-called scholars because everyone that professes to be a teacher that doesn't use his name, that lies about the days of the, of the week, that doesn't isn't honest about when he rose from the dead on the dawn before the Sabbath, right? Before it was dawn of the Shabbat, right? It's intentionally hidden and kept secret from people so that we don't learn the truth. But when you come to the truth with what's in the scrolls, all that stuff comes apart. When you start studying history, then you really learn what I'm talking about. But I recommend his word first. You can find the truth. And then when you look at what's out there, it makes sense. All right. So it says, in the writings of the moon, or on the moon rather, Two words are used for the full moon in crescent, chodesh and dok, respectively. There is a de debate on which is which for some reason. They say that they don't really know what the word duka, dalet, wa, kof, he, right, means. And to argue it could be crescent moon or full. Chodesh is the other word. And it is either a case of miscomprehension based on preconceived assumptions or intentional disinformation on their part. It could be that they look to the opinions of the Yahudim who count the Chodeshim or months by the Yarok moon, not acknowledging that they are two different words. And this is actually foretold to be happening as a curse upon his people for going away from the light of the world. They're following after man or the uh, giving up to the kingdom, if you will, of men, which is correlated to the moon, if you remember, we've gone over that. And if anyone's interested, there's a video on Gad the Seer chapter one that goes over the vision that he had there. And there's a section that talks about the song of the lamb and how the lamb was put on the moon. So we go over throughout the scriptures with, Genesis, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, and everywhere that we could find the reference to the moon and how that's literally tied to the kingdom and the genealogy of Dawid, if you will. And that's a phenomenon you can still see prevalent today. 
blood moons over America, blood crescent moon when the uh, king, the newly inaugurated king in England was uh, put on. These things happen for a purpose, but we are not really cognizant of them. So I recommend you check that out if you want to know what that is about. It says, um, and this isn't a new phenomenon. They did it, the Yahudim went that way before then when they left Mitzrayim after mixing, when they made the Greek city-states, they were following a lunar calendar, just like Babylon. That's where it came from. And then when the uh, Northern Kingdom went apostate, again, you had the Saxons and Germanic peoples following the lunar calendar. Same phenomenon. Yes, I'll link that and everything else as well. Just remind me too, because I try to do everything I mention. I, I put it where it's easily accessible. I'll try to also put it in the description of the video for anyone that's listening. So it says a modern scholar has tricked or has tried to tackle this subject against the accepted standards of our days and has written books, articles, and videos, and more on the topic. Here is one example. And this is um, from the sun to the moon. It was a article written by that professor Elior I can't remember her name but she's a prevalent professor of the Dead Sea Scrolls it says not to rely on man scripture makes it clear that those who reject the truth get deception as our reward but we can find this quote in the apostolic constitutions on the topic book 5 chapter 17 it is therefore your duty, brethren, who are redeemed by the precious blood of Mashiach, to observe the days of the Passover exactly, with all care, after the vernal equinox. Least you be obliged to keep the memorial of the one passion twice in a year. Keep it only once, or once only, in a year for him that died but once. Do not you yourselves compute, but keep it when your brethren of the circumcision do so, the ones of the sons of Louis and the, the, the Yahudim who already knew the calendar, right? But no longer keep it, or but no longer be careful to keep the feast with the Yahudim, the ones who rejected the truth. For we have now no communion with them, for they have been led astray in regard to the calculation itself, which they think they accomplish perfectly that they may be led astray on every hand and be fenced off from the truth. And then that was my comment there. You can read if you want to. It says, As can be seen above, early believers were enjoined to follow those of the circumcision that believed, which would have been a host of the Kohanim, if you recall. And the word of Elohim spread, and the number of the taught ones increased greatly in Yerushalayim, and a great many of the Kohanim were obedient to the belief. Maaseh, or Acts 6 7. Barnabas, you may recall, was also of the sons of Louis. Back to the point. The two words, while they may be ambiguous to modern scholars, are known well enough before the intentional obfuscation or the intentional confusion by the Counter Reformation and their campaign of disinformation. The following is found in Ernest Klein's A Comprehensive Etymological Dictionary of the Hebrew Language for Readers of English, which we have that on the Telegram. And if you want to join the Telegram, you're more than welcome to. But all these resources that we, we mentioned, we always put on the Telegram too for everyone to have if it's a PDF and available. It says, It should be apparent that after seeing these definitions, that Dok should stand for the crescent moon, and Chodesh stand for the full. Page 118, you have Dok, to consider, to be exact. On 123, Dik with a Yod in the middle, is to be exact, to be precise. He calculated exactly. And Dok, or Dok, without the Wa, which is interchangeable. Page 130, Thin, Lean, small, fine, minute, tender, weak. As con contrasted with Chodesh, Chodesh, page 209, to be new, 
to be renewed, renovated, restored month. Unfortunately, the use of Chodesh for the full moon is used to legitimize the use of the moon for reckoning the months. And what I mean is because there are scrolls that say Chodesh and Dok, where they're going through the three-year cycle of the full moon and the crescent moon, so you can follow where you're at on his calendar, right? It's always to stay in conjunction with the 364-day year. That was the only purpose of it. But because it says Chodesh, or Chodesh here, people use that to legitimize using the moon for reckoning the months. But that is something resoundingly refuted in the scrolls themselves and only supported by modern adherence to error. The word Chodesh is also used for the word month, but with no association with the moon whatsoever. It always has the sense of being renewed or restored. And that word is also used in the Psalms for a new song. There are four Chodeshim that are what we call Shabbats and what Yobelim calls Yamim or Days of Remembrance, which are ordained forever. One witness, not intentionally, but inadvertently, is the account of the Psalms and Songs of Dawid as recorded in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is account of Dawid's poems. Dawid, or David, if you will, which means beloved, okay? The son of Yeshai, which is he is a gift, or he is my gift, my present. Was prudent and brilliant like the light of the sun, a scribe, intelligent and perfect in all his ways before Elohim and men. Yahuwah gave him an intelligent and brilliant ruach, and he wrote 3,600 psalms and 364 songs to sing before the altar for the daily perpetual sacrifice. For all the yamim of the year, and 52 songs for the Sabbath offerings, and 30 songs for the new months, for the feast days, and for the Yom or Day of Atonement. In all, the songs which he uttered were 446, and four songs to make music on behalf of those stricken by evil Ruach Oath. So here is an, they actually had songs to cast away evil spirits. And that is one that he would have played, if you remember, whenever the evil Ruach was afflicting Shaul, who went reprobate and had our creator's Ruach leave him. If you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and compare the two Ruachoth that rule over every man, and then you look at the accounts of how Shaul was compared to how Dawid was, you can see the contrast of who had which one by the manifest fruits of how they behave. So it says, In all, there were 4,050. All these were uttered through foretelling, which was given before him, or it was given him from before the Most High. So every one of his psalms is of foretelling, just so you know. And this is part of 4Q88, column 27, Apocryphal Psalms of Dawid. So as a second witness to the Chodeshim is seen in Yobelim. And this was, again, to prove that there's only four because there's only 30 songs, you know, there's 25 feast days, there's one day of atonement, there's only four left for the new months, right? And a second witness is right here in the, uh, it says, and a second witness is the Chodeshim is seen in Yobelim or the Book of Jubilees, where we will also find an affirmation of 364 Yamim in a year, four remembrance days, the divisions between each and a refutation of using the moon or to intercalate any days between years. This is long but covers a lot of information and literally refutes all the things that people are apostatizing on through error. But this is Yobelim or Jubilees chapter 6. 
and on the new month of the first month, and on the new month of the fourth month, and on the new month of the seventh month, and on the new month of the tenth month are the Yamim, or days of remembrance, and the Yamim of the seasons of, in the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever. A lot of people say men can't do that, but he is your father, and honoring your father's orders what he establishes for your children is considered a righteous act. The Rechabites are another example where they dwelt in tents and didn't drink wine, not because Yahuwah told them not to, but because their father told them not to. And they were obedient to that. And because of this, Yahuwah said that there would never fail to be a man of his to stand before him. So, <clears throat> Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever so that they will have become thereby a memorial unto him. And on the new month of the first month, he was bidden to make for himself an ark. And on that yom, the earth became dry, and he opened and saw the earth. And on the new month of the fourth month, the, month, the mouths of the deeps, or sorry, the mouths of the depths of the abyss beneath were closed. And on the new month of the seventh month, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were opened, and the waters began to descend into them. And on the new month of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains were seen, and Noah was glad. And on this account, he ordained them for himself as feasts for a memorial forever. And thus are they ordained. And they placed them on the Shamayim tablets, each had thirteen weeks, from one to another their memorial, from the first to the second, and from the second to the third, and from the third to the fourth. And all the yamim of the commandment will be fifty-two weeks of yamim, or days, and the entire year complete. Thus it is engraved and ordained on the Shamayim tablets, and there is no neglecting for a single year or from year to year, and command you, the children of Israel, that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days, and will constitute a complete year, and will not disturb its time from Yamim and from its feasts, for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony, and they will not leave out any day, nor disturb any feasts. But if they do not, sorry, but if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment, then they will disturb all their seasons, and the years will be dislodged from this, and they will neglect their ordinances, and all the children of Israel will forget. Now, it says they will disturb their seasons. With the lunar calendar, you know that happens by them having to add the 13th month that is nowhere commanded. And with the perverted Gregorian calendar, if you're paying attention, they literally will have their years shift throughout the seasons in the very same way that um, Islam's Ramadan will shift throughout the seasons based on their calendar. So uh, the more you see the patterns, the more these things make sense. But there's echoes of error that keep happening for these purposes because his word is true and that's how reality functions but it says and they will disturb all their seasons and the years will be dislodged from this and they will neglect their ordinances and all the children of israel will forget and will not find the path of the years and will forget the new months and seasons and sabbaths and they will go wrong as to all the order of the years. For I know, and from henceforth will I declare it unto you, and it is not of my own devising. For the book is written before me, and on the Shamayim tablets the division of Yamim is ordained. Least they forget the feasts of the covenant, and walk according to the feasts of the nations, after their error and after their ignorance." For there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon, 
how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year, ten days too soon. For this reason the years will come upon them when they will disturb and make an abomination the day of testimony, and an unclean yom a feast yom, and they will confound all the days, the set apart with the unclean, and the unclean with the set apart. For they will go wrong as to the months and Sabbaths, and feasts, and Yobelim. For this reason I command and protest to you, that you may protest to them. For after, protestari, it, it's originally, they say protester, right? But the Protestants, it means to witness, if you don't know. For after your death, your children will disturb them, so that they will not make the year 364 yamim only. And for this reason they will go wrong as to the new months and seasons and Sabbaths and festivals, and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. Meaning no distinction of clean and unclean for your, your dietary instructions, which were never changed for his children. Even in the heresy section it says some things don't change. Although it's a perversion they try to get you to do. But all you have to do is look at what Yahushua doesn't change, and he gave permission for legions of demons to get cast into herds of pigs. You eat them at your own risk. That's all I have to say about that. <clears throat> See also 4Q328. Kohen service as the seasons change. Sorry, that's an error. It says, see also 4Q328, priest service or Kohen service as the seasons change to see a 364 Yom year and how it is broken down into four seasons of 13 weeks each, 91 Yamim in each. With the last day of each year being the sign, first the equal or it first the 91st day of spring is the longest day of the year, and then the next day is the first day of summer. The 91st day of summer is the equal day and night, equal light and darkness, and then the next day is the first day of winter, or I'm sorry, fall. And then 91st day of fall, the shortest day of the year, the next day is the first day of winter, and then the 91st day of winter Equal light and darkness is the last day of the year, the next one being the first day of the next year. But that's not possible when you intercalate or you add days between them or weeks or whatever. It cannot, these patterns will never make sense if you do that. It says, for the fourth day of the week start, the fact that the calendar starts the first day of the calendar year starts on the fourth day of the literal week. You can see that in 4Q394 section A, the Sabbaths and festivals of the year, and 4Q319, calendar of the Shamayim signs. This latter scroll also shows the 49 year Yobel and 294 six Yobelim cycles. For more on that, if you want to know about a fourth day start, if you look at the account in Exodus chapter 16, they're traveling on the 15th. That night, they grumble and complain. The next day, they're told they would see the esteem of Yahuwah, and then they do on the Sabbath, which is the 16th of that second month. And he tells them, in the evening, you will get meat. And in the morning you shall have bread from the Shemaim. That evening, on the 16th of that Sabbath, he gave them birds that they slaughtered and cooked at night. And it was not counted as a sin because it was not the Sabbath day. And then the next day was the 17th. And that was the first of the six days where he does that. If you count backwards from then, you'll see that the first day of the first month was on the fourth day of the year. Um, is there a video with those writings on them? I don't know. We haven't actually gone through too much of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, in particular for the calendar information. 
I put this one together for everyone to go study these individual things on their own. And I'll be quite honest, it is, um, I find this stuff fascinating. I love reading and learning the things and I can soak it all in personally. It doesn't matter whether it's the lists of names and numbers or the, the mantra of the moon through a three year cycle of monotonous text, but some people can't, they can't read through all that easily. So if you look at this and see what it's intended to do, and then you, you peruse through that, you might have to do it three, four or five times before you actually get what it's trying to show you. Um, it might be something we can do at some point in time, however, just depends on if everyone wants to or not. Like I said, I don't mind reading through it, but other people might. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, lastly, scrolls 4Q320 through 321A called the synchronized calendars shows the six-year Cohen cycle. Ah, uh, okay. There's two PDFs that I have available. We can have them on Telegram if you want to join there. All of this stuff is there. If not, either sister or one of the sisters or I can email you. But we have what's called the Complete Scrolls from the Penguin Edition. It was part, it's the seventh edition of that one, but it was the original version of the Dead Sea Scrolls made public in 1991 to the people. It doesn't have everything that was made available eventually, but it was the first. And you have some interesting translations, mentioning of a crucifix and a dove and some other things that you might not find elsewhere. And then on top of that one, we have the study edition, which is really a two volume set in paperback, but it gives you the Hebrew or Aramaic on one page and then the English on the other. The only problem with that one is it, it separates everything in its own proper scroll and it doesn't show you all of them. It just gives you quite a few. So you don't, you really have to piece them all together to try to get what any individual text is saying. If you want to buy a hard copy version that has most of it put together in an easy to read fashion, you can do it's called A New Translation, the Dead Sea Scrolls, A New Translation. And that has three authors, I think, uh, Weiss, Sop, Michael Weiss is one of them. But that has generally all of the scrolls there, and it compiles the ones that are redundant to give you one reading of what it would generally say. It's not perfect. There's some things I don't agree with, and I really, I try to steer away from their commentary. But if you want a source with the English, that'd be the best copy. If you want to be able to study the Hebrew, then the two volume set, which is over $100 if you buy the hard copies, but the PDF, again, I'll give you for free. It says, uh, to continue here, these scrolls right here, 4Q320 and 321A, the, called the synchronized calendars, show the six year Kohen cycle. Below is another witness to the year not shifting, as well as the synchronization of the sun and moon, something that happens every third year and does not account for intercalation of any kind. And I keep mentioning this part because this is the kicker. Out of all the different calendars that people profess to follow the Zadok calendar, this is the one thing they don't, they're not following is the full moon on the first of the year every third year. It is the literal sign we're given that it makes to show we're on the right track, right? But right here, it's Hanok 72. I mentioned this part because some people like to start the beginning of the year with the signs. So the equal day and night, they'll say is day one instead of being the last day of the year. And that's what you see right here. It cannot be the first day because it is the last one. Chapter 72, verse 32, it says, On that day, or yom, the night shortens and becomes nine parts, and the yom, nine parts. 
okay? Then the night becomes equal with the yom and the yamim of the year add up to exactly 364 yamim. So that equal day and night is the last day of the year, the last day of winter. All the signs are that 91st day. And then the remembrances are the first of the first month, first of the fourth month, first of the tenth month, and first of the, or sorry, first of the seventh, Yom Teruah, and then first of the tenth month. So it says, the lengths of the days and the nights, as well as the shortness of the Yom and the night, or Lila, are determined by the course of the circuit of the sun and distinguished by it. All authority was given to our Mashiach. He's the light of the world, like the bridegroom, which is like the sun. Nothing inconsistent with the truth. The circuit becomes longer or shorter, yom by yom, and night by night, respectively. Thus, this is the order for the course of the movement and the settlement of the sun, that great luminary which is called the sun, for the duration of the years of the creation in respect to its going in and coming out. It is that very luminary which manifests itself in its appearance, as Yahuwah has commanded that it shall come out and go in, in this manner. And then the conjunction with the moon, you can see Hanok 74, starting at verse 11. It says, The gain of the sun and of the stars turns out to be ten yamim in three years, Ten yamim every year adds up to 30 yamim, which is why you have that added month for Adar, for the Yahudim keeping a lunar calendar, and that's how the moon can be full in its conjunction every third year. It falls back 10, 20, 30, and then it's full again. And the moon falls behind the sun and the stars for 30 yamim. They bring about all the years punctuate punctiliously so that they forever neither gain upon nor fall behind their fixed positions for a single day but they convert the year with punctuous righteousness into 364 days or yamim here we can see the signs to look for after each season turns from half a month to a month away and this is something anyone can see it really depends on your climate where how far you are away from what they call the equator, right? The center course for the sun determines your your seasons, the full amount of illumination. There are differences. But generally, from about a month away from the new season, you can start to see telltale signs of what that season will bring, a foreshadow or a foreknowledge of what's to come, because he does nothing without first revealing things to his servants, the foretellers everything being true, right? It says, we will see little signs of the new seasons, but we see all as stated after they start. Literally everything on that first day will be accomplished or it will be evident. This is something I have only been tracking since 2018 or 19, maybe later. And this is from Hanok, chapter 82, starting on verse 13. It says, these are the names of the leaders which divide the four seasons of the years, which are fixed. Malkiel, Hamla, Amelek, Mila, Milayul, sorry, and Narel. I butchered those. I apologize. I'm sorry. The names of those who lead them are Adnarol, Yesusel, and Ilumel. These three follow the leaders of their orders as well as the four which follow after the three leaders of the orders, which follow after those leaders of the stations that divide the four seasons of the year. One leader for each season, then three follow for each one of the months, then the four leaders that end the seasons with the signs. At the very beginning, Malkiel, whose name is called Tamayen, and the sun rises and rules, and all the days of his authority during which he reigns are ninety-one days. And these are the signs of the days which become manifest during the period of his authority, sweat, 
heat, and dryness. All the trees bear fruit, and leaves grow on all trees. There will be good harvest, rose flowers, and all the flowers which grow in the field. But the winter tree shall wither. And these are the names of the leaders which, this is like the um, Halle Berry tree, I think it's called. Holly Berry tree, sorry. <laughs> and it says, and these are the names of the leaders which are their subordinates, Barakel, Zelebzeel, and another additional one, a captain of a thousand named Halu Yasef, and the days of the authority of this one have been completed. A lot of people try to add doctrines and things and come up with what this might mean. We don't have definitive information. You can't do anything but guess. But if you go by what is in reality and you learn how things actually function, this can make sense. The sun makes a circuit, right, in 364 yamin for a year. It's equivalent, there, although there's only 12 hours in a day, the light portion that we perceive, there is about a 24-hour circuit before it returns. And that will generally, that might fluctuate throughout the year. Uh, it, it's consistent, though, with the 364 yamin period. The stars move faster. When they say the sun makes a circuit in 24 hours, the stars do it in 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 point something seconds. So by the time the sun reaches its completion, you have about 4 minutes and a little bit extra movement of the stars each 24-hour period. If you times that amount, that 4 minutes plus, by 364 days, you get 24 hours, point two five something. And that's where they get their extra day and their, their quarter of a day for a leap year. Because the Gregorian calendar, which is a witchcraft calendar, is keyed and bows down to the entire host of the heavens. It actually just follows the stars. That's the fact. You can prove this when you look at any star chart. It, it's got the Gregorian calendar around the circle of the edge, you line up what day of the year with what time of the day, and you'll find the stars that will be overhead because that's what that calendar is keyed to. It is not keyed to the sun. But knowing that, you can see that the days of uh, illuminaries being completed could mean that that one's now shifted out of the influence of where it was at because they're not in the same order. We call it the procession of the equinoxes in antiquity. It's also known as a, um, the, the star movement is a sidereal day or sidereal day, if you will. But in the beginning of creation, spring started with the sun in what we call Taurus or the bull. And then it slowly moved from there to the ram or the lamb, Aries. It was first the, you know, he was charging through and then it, it lines up with the um, the four good news accounts and the four manifestations of his coming. We've talked about that before, but I don't want to get too sidetracked. Point is, the luminary shift in relation to when the sun is starting the seasons. And that would be what you can see right here with the stars completing their duty of their authority. You can see that in the good news accounts as our Mashiach being the sun, bringing the, the kingdom, which is like the moon. And he set up the 12 and then the 72, which are the stars. <clears throat> he went two by two before them into every place, or he sent them two by two before him into every place to which he was going to go himself. In the same way, the stars move faster, faster than the sun. Sorry, I'm trying to speak fast so I can get all this information in for you guys. Back on track here. You can see these things, and then you'll know that you're in that season. You can see the telltale signs about a month before. This is for the season of, of spring, right? Sweat, heat, dryness, and all the trees bear fruit, and leaves grow on all trees, but the winter tree withers, right? And these are the names. I already read that one. Sorry, we're going to go to the next one. It says, And the next leader after him 
was Hela Emmelech, whose name they call the bright sun. Halo, Helios, right? And all the days of his light are 91 days. And these are the days of signs upon signs upon the earth. Scorching heat and drought, trees will produce their glowing fruits and in part of their ripened fruits. The sheep shall seek one another and become pregnant, and all the fruits of the earth are gathered in, and all that is in the fields as well as the winepress. These things shall take place in the days of his authority. These are the names, the orders, and we're missing fall and winter. But if you had those, and we find allusions of them elsewhere, I would encourage you to look at the scriptures, see what it talks about those seasons, and then compare it to when that is actually happening. Because that's how we have to define what is true. His word is true. Right? Says these are the names, the orders, and the subordinates of those captains over thousands, Gedaliel, Heliael, and Kiel. And the name of the one that is added together with them is a captain over a thousand called Asphael. The days of the authority of this one have been completed. I already mentioned we're missing the last two. Says the last section here is confirming witnesses in scripture that support this view. The view that you do not intercalate, okay, and that this calendar is correct. I'm also not covering all throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, like the account of the flood and other accounts of things, just like in the book of what they call Yobelim. They give specific dates at specific times that only fit on this calendar. And you can actually find this very same phenomenon in the Exodus account with what the children walked out. And then our very, the Passion Week of our Mashiach. It all fits with this calendar. If you look at the plain text, although there's some things that are messed up with that. Um, I highly encourage everyone who does not know to look at the accounts of the resurrection. Pay particular attention to the word that they use for week and the word they use for one. Because it is only used such places nine times. Other, everywhere else it's first and Sabbath. So, or yeah, one in Sabbath, not first. I'm sorry. But moving on. It says, these are all confirming or supporting scriptures for this, okay? It says, once I have sworn by my Kodeshah, I do not lie to Dawid. But beloved, his seed shall be forever and his throne as the sun before me. Like the moon, it is established forever. And the witness in the Shamayim is steadfast. Selah. That is part of the, the moon being tied to the kingdom. And how this works. Our Mashiach is the light of truth given to the people. The kingdom given to the children of Dawid. You have from, from Abraham to Dawid is 14 generations. Like the crescent to the full moon. And then from Dawid to the captivity is 14 generations like the full moon to the dark moon. And then from the return to the coming of our Mashiach is 14 generations from the crescent to the full. And that kind of pattern is something you can see all throughout and still happening today. Like I was trying to mention, the, the, the Malkuth Shamayim and the physical literal kingdom is connected with the moon in parable form in the very same way that the seed is the word so while this is a literal foretelling, a literal covenant to Dawid the king, that his children would be perpetually on a throne over the children of Israel, and that is true, we've, we've tracked that elsewhere, this is in like manner exactly true, saying that the beloved, our Mashiach's word, will be established forever as the son before him, and that is the kingdom that he came and established forever. It is the same because he cannot lie. The truth is always true in every context he gives it. That was from Tehillim or Psalms 89, 35 through 37. It says, Yahuwah, your loving kindness is in the Shamayim, and your trustworthiness reaches to the clouds. 
Tehillim or Psalms 36, 5. For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Yisrael after those days, declares Yahuwah. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall they teach each one his eth neighbor, and each one his eth brother, saying, No eth Yahuwah. For they shall all know my oath, me, it's translated as, but literally my oath, my aleph through tau, right? From the least of them to the greatest of them declares Yahuwah, for I shall forgive their crookednesses or their crookedness and remember their sin no more. Thus said Yahuwah, who gives the sun for a light by day and the laws of the moon and the stars for a light by Lila, who stirs up the sea and its waves roar, Yahuwah Zavaot, or Yahuwah of hosts of armies, is his name. If these laws vanish from before me, declares Yahuwah, then the seed of Yisrael shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. And that is also true and tracked through history. There is never at one point where they have not been a nation, a people, with the literal seed of Dawid ruling over them since it was given. Even when Zadik Yahu was taken and that kingdom was destroyed. It says, And Debar Yahuwah, or that's from Yeremi Yahu, sorry, Jeremiah 31, 33 through 36. And Debar Yahuwah, or the word of Yahuwah, came to Yeremi Yahu, saying, Thus said Yahuwah, If you could break my covenant with the Yom and my covenant with the Lila, so that there be not Yom and night in their season, then my covenant could also be broken with Dawid, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Luiim, the Kohanim, my attendants, like the children of light. As the host of the Shamaim are counted, or sorry, is not counted, nor the sand of the sea measured. So I increase the descendants of Dawid, my servant, and the Luiim who attend upon me. And the word of Yahuwah came to Yeremiyahu, saying, Have you not observed what these people have spoken, saying the two clans which Yahuwah has chosen have been rejected by him, so that they have despised my people no more to be a nation before them? Thus said Yahuwah, If my covenant is not with Yom and Lila, and if I have not appointed the laws of the Shamayim and earth, then I would also reject the descendants of Yaakov and Dawid, my servant, so that I should not take of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Yitzach, and Yaakov, for I shall turn back their captivity and have compassion on them. Yirmiyahu 33, 19-26 through 26. Since this comprehension of the calendar was even taught by Kepha and his taught ones, and this is from what is called the Recognitions of Clement, which is really the, the acts and the preaching and teaching of Shimon Kepha, or who they call Simon Peter, if you will. Okay, This is from Book 8, Chapter what is that, 45, Motions of the Sun and Moon. This is after... Kepha had been preaching for a while. He had had taught ones with him for quite some time. He allowed his, some of his taught ones who were showing the inclination to speak before him to the benefit of the people to try to have them turn to the belief. He was he was uh, training them into being evangelists, if you will. Says Achilla, one of his taught ones, okay, I will do so without delay. And what he's doing is showing that there is um, order and disorder both with those things that are created, okay? Because he, the his father, who he didn't know it was his dad at the time, couldn't get the idea that things could be done disorderly by a creator. And the things that he saw in the world were not always done in order. So, so I will do so without delay. Two visible signs are shown in Shamayim, one of the sun the other of the moon, 
and these are followed by five other stars, each describing its own separate orbit. And those are the vis those are the what we call planets, the wandering stars that are visible to the naked eye. Two of them are not of the seven, and that also lines up with the assembly. Yahushua being like the light of the sun, the Malkuth Shamayim being like the moon, the twelve constellations being the twelve emissaries, the seventy-two being the the deacons. And then you have um, the five, or not the deacons, but the the uh, the other taught ones that he sent out to go evangelize. And then you had the seven wandering stars of the seven deacons that served for the widows and orphans. Okay? And of those seven, two became no longer visible. Stephanos, Stephen, was a martyr. And Nicholas was an apostate. He was the beginnings of the Nicolaitans of which Yahushua hates, who amalgamated the paganism with the belief, which is now known as Catholicism, just for context. If you want all that information in exhaustive detail, and you want to know how these luminaries are used to foretell throughout the book of Revelation, I highly encourage you to look at the Antichrist for Dummies video series on YouTube from christmasisalie.com channel, okay? I can't agree with everything that he posts. I, I highly recommend you test everything for yourself, but the facts speak for themselves. What was in the sky and then the events that happened cannot be faked. And the things that are shared there are rather astounding. But let's finish up right here. It says, these therefore, the sun and the moon and the, the wandering stars, these therefore Elohim has placed in the sky by which the temperature of the air may be regulated according to the seasons, and the order of changes and alternations may be kept. But by means of the very same, if at any time he sends plague and corruption upon the earth for the sins of men, the air is disturbed. Pestilence is brought upon animals, blight upon crops, and a destructive year in every way upon men. Thus it is that by one and the same means order is both kept and destroyed. For it is clear even to the unbelieving and unskillful that the course of the sun, which is useful and necessary to the world, and which is assigned by providence, is always kept orderly. But the courses of the moon, in comparison of the course of the sun, seem to the unskillful to be inordinate and unsettled in her waxing and wanings. For the sun moves in fixed and orderly periods. From him are hours. 12. From him the yom when he rises. From him also the lila when he sets all authority given to the light of the world. Not an inconsistent picture with anything that we already have all throughout Scripture. From him months and years are reckoned. From him the variations of seasons are produced. While rising to the higher regions, as the circuit goes further and further north, it the sun literally rises in elevation as well, so it can still be perceived all the way in Australia and to the extremities of the southern regions. Unlike what happens when it goes south, which is why you have perpetual darkness in the northern regions in certain areas. <clears throat> he tempers the spring. Sorry. He says, from him months and years are reckoned. From him the variations of seasons are produced. While rising to the higher regions, he tempers the spring. But when he reaches the top of the Shemaim, the longest day of the year, right? Then he goes back south or down as well. He kindles the summer's heats. Again sinking, he produces the temper of autumn. And when he returns to his lowest circle, he bequeaths to us the rigor of winter's cold from the icy binding of the Shemaim meaning the electromagnetic currents that move the winds, that move the waters that precip and precipitation throughout the ether and affect all these things, it is pushed 
by Antarctica, that ice circle inward. And that's what gives us the winter cold, just so you know. But that's all I have on this one. So we're going to go ahead and say thank you all for attending, everyone that chose to join. And we will see you next week. We're going to have questions in just a moment. I was just going to say, let everyone off. Um, we'll see you next time. Shabbat Shalom and Shavuot Tov.